Good morning. How are we? Yes. Um, we are very close to the finish line, so let's hang in there. Um, we are going to, or I am going to introduce our, our teacher for this morning, our speaker for this morning. And um, we are going to, or he's going to lead us to think and talk about the topic. being an imagined adult Christian in a secular world. With everything we are discussing about and discovering about, um, you know the first S, right? Uh -huh. Dr. Tivia is going to help us as imagined adults know some of our, the practices and responsibilities we should um, engage in so that we maintain our Christian faith. Um, again, I'm going to introduce somebody who needs no introduction. Um, our speaker this morning wears many hats. He does many things. But what I admire about him is his, um, his love for God, love for God's people, and love for the things of God. Then, and that's the reason why we always hoist him as a model for um, young Christians. I'm sure he's going to fight me over that, but that's the case. This man we are going to listen to has a, has a huge interest in education. And for his own education, his first degree is from Legon. He studied sociology and psychology. He has about four master's degrees in Abeka. No one can it. <laughs> he has an MED, MDiv, MAR, and MSc. And he has two doctoral degrees. Uh -huh. And with all that, I say that, I, I, he, he wouldn't want me to mention it, but I say that to say that with all that, he still remains a humble Christian. And that is what um, is, is something we should emulate. Our speaker this morning is married to um, his only wife, Dr. Lynn Teria, who is not yet here. And their union has been blessed with three kids, Ajoa, Abina, and Kwan, all of them uh, adults now. So with a round of applause, mm. With a round of applause, let's receive Dr. Augustine Taylor. Okay. Yes. And thank you for the lavish introduction. <laughs> but there's the other side of me that they don't know. Um, um, a preacher, which means I'm a minister of the gospel. What is the reputation of ministers of the gospel in our current culture. Mm, not too good. Is that not so? Not too good. From the international TDJs and what's going on to the big minister who was the chairman of the bank. Are you following my line of thought? Yes. The big minister who was the chairman of the bank, the bank collapsed and he said he didn't know what he was doing and many more. Then you come to the other side. I'm a member of the member of parliament. Oh, that's even worse. <laughs> what, is, what is the reputation of politicians? Not good. So you see how much you can take away from what he has already said this morning. But the issue is, where is God when you're a minister of the gospel? The issue is, where is God when you do national politics. And if you don't find God as your grade, as the base from which you launch out to do what you are supposed to do, what you need to do, we have a problem. So we continue to explore. And we appreciate the prayers. Sometimes I get bad rap from brothers for just being in politics. Uh, very not so nice letters I get sometimes. Um, 
and sometimes some complementary ones too. But remember, we have a job to do to transform this country for Christ. And in the process, we have to be at the public square. We have to be at the every tower. We have to be in the farm. We have to be on the mountaintop. And we have to be in the valley with the people. And so if you are waiting until all those potentially criticizing you now uh, completely die out, then we will have what? A problem. So it is not just that simple to just think, oh, the brothers will say this. The brothers will say that. So I can't do this. I can't do this. There are so many things I can't do. Not because of what the brothers will say. I listen to what the brothers will say because I'm a member of a community. And as part of my participation in the community, I have to listen to community members and their concerns because we work together. And if my actions and inactions would make a problem for the church, I have to be careful how I step out. At the same time, if I'm going to quench all the fires, all the concerns, all the, all the inhibitions from people, what will happen? Nobody will do anything. Nobody. When we started campus ministry, it was a huge opposition. We were 14, 13 males and one female at the University of Ghana. In 1988, when we started meeting there, oh, we started an elitist movement. A brother took the reminder, the paper, and circulated things about us, made excerpts from the paper, things that we had never intended to say, and circulated it all over the country. Because we've started a church on campus, and we have a publication addressing the needs of youth, asking them to get into ministry. Imagine that that made us quit what would have happened? Yesterday, Brother Frank talked about going to other places. We went to Koforidia, we went to Sunyani. Everywhere there was a higher education institution. We went there at the time. And now, look at the products. Professor Tia, uh, Brother Yim, who was speaking here, Fred was part of that, and many others, yes. If you go to the UK churches, all the leaders there are from Ghana, and basically they are from our campus ministry efforts. If you go to the US, where Brother Jaime and some of you know him, they have bought a two million, two million dollar facility in the Bronx, and have a vibrant congregation, Ghanaian congregation of the Church of Christ. They sing your three hymns to my dismay. They do to my dismay because I think they should be singing English songs. Their children are not getting it. But the point is, they are there in large numbers. They are there in large numbers. In Canada, a brother just came from Calgary. I don't know whether he will be here this morning. Last week, we spent the time in Accra, and he's talking about the Ghanaian leadership. And a lot of these people were in our campus ministries. So God is shaping his church through you. Yesterday, those of us who are observers were thinking, if this number that is here today would actually embrace an integrated theology, an integrated understanding of being a Christian as not what? One life on Sunday morning where we have white, and then on Monday we put on our blue jeans and we put on our bad manners. And that it is an integrated lifestyle. I'm called in Jesus. The people in this room can change this country. The people in this group, all of us here, together working, we will give a new face of the church. We will witness to Jesus Christ, and many more will come and embrace Jesus Christ because of just this number in this auditorium this morning. So, so much can be done. So much will be done, and we will move on. Let me limit myself, I have other concerns, but let me limit myself to what I have been assigned by my boss, Brother Frank. I get in trouble with him all the time because we have fun. 
to the dismay of our spouses. Because if we get on the phone, we don't quit. And we are doing our theology, uh, theology on the telephone. And they want us maybe some time to do something else at the time. All right. So I'm speaking on being an emerging adult Christian in a secular world. Being an emerging adult Christian in a secular world. Already, that conception presupposes something. Because being an emerging Christ, uh, adult Christian in a secular world assumes certain things about the world we, we live in. So I'm going to stay to that and talk about it. I have divided the topic into three and my time allotted appropriately. The first thing is talk about the emerging adult believer, emerging adult individual in our society, becoming emerging adult. Then who we are in Christ. If you are an emerging adult, then what do you become in Christ? And because of who you are, what is the implication of life for lifestyle? Who you are. And in, more importantly, I was assigned the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 17 through 32. And what is interesting, in my doctoral studies, we have to translate the book of Ephesians from uh, Greek to English. And I'm glad Dr. Oster is not here this morning. Because within the churches of Christ, he is probably the outstanding scholar on the book of Ephesians. In fact, internationally recognized. And he retired this year from Harding School of Theology. So uh, I'm, I'm glad he's not here because he might be able to get a little nuance. Ah, Augustine, this word in the Sidepigrapha meant this. But actually, when he came to Latin, they meant that we will not do that this morning. In fact, I'm not going to allude to any Greek word here. So be relaxed. All right. But the point is, Ephesians gives us a very interesting picture of the issue of your identity in Christ and because of your identity in Christ, certain behaviors that are non-negotiable. That becomes part of your identity in Christ. So the assumption for the secular issues that we've been talking about in the last three days but I Frank sum it up for me, and I changed very little about the assignment and the nature of the secular society he offered me. He said, all historical, philosophical, political, and socioeconomic indicators point to the fact that we are now living in a secular world. Hmm. Now, I was given the liberty not to do a lecture, but I Frank said, this is Sunday school. And that means a school classroom setting means that I can ask for what? Participation. So, Johannes, I sent him mail at 2 a.m. He's supposed to be here and read the Bible for me so that I can be faster. So if Johannes is not here, Dr. Poku, let me list, enlist you to be my Bible reader. All historical, philosophical, political, and socioeconomic indicators point to the fact that we are living in the secular world. In the last two days, the word secular, secularism, secularization has been explored extensively. What do we mean when we say that the current social structure basically points with the fact that now we are not in a religious or some religious we say a, a mystical type and that instead we are in a secular state we are the society is moving towards a secular community what do we mean by that we are working towards a secular state a secular community 
All right. I did a master's here, University of Cape Coast, and I had a professor, um, J.K. Owusu, at the Institute of Educational Planning. And he has something called volu compo, voluntary compulsory. If he asks a question and he doesn't get a response, he volunteers somebody. And compulsorily, you have the responsibility to offer an answer. And what I would do if I'm not getting good responses, I don't know your names, but I know your schools. <laughs> I know your schools. So I would just say University of Ghana on that side, Winneba on this side, Fusu College of Education, Mampong, Amstead, the longest university name in this country. <laughs> When the bill came to parliament, we were considering it. We laughed and laughed and laughed about it, of the name. Secular state, secular world. The world is going towards a secular world. Let me tell you, from my perspective, I'm 62 years old. I'm an old guy. I have seen a lot of things in this country. And I'm blessed to see especially how technology has turned things around in this country. But if you want to laugh about it, I came to Accra at the age of 13. I had never seen electricity before. Hmm. Some people say, really? I had never seen television before. I had never seen telephone before. Indeed, I had never seen refrigerator before. I have never seen pipe bone water before. We went to the river every morning to get water, as Fred spoke about this morning, uh, yesterday. Very different world. And all the things that happened in my world were religious things. Everything was religion. If you are bathing, you shouldn't be singing or talking. Why? Your mother will die. That was a belief. Of course, your mother will die because you swallow soap, and that will kill you. We don't know the kind of soap they had there. And if you die, your mother too will die. So it was a good explanation for you to what? Not to do that. Everything was religion. In my village, the river is Kweku, Wednesday. So on Wednesday, women didn't go to the river. Women didn't go there on Wednesdays. And then, at that time of the month, they also don't go to the river to fetch water. They stand at a distance, the men take the bucket and get the water and give it to them. Everything. At 6 p.m., they stop pounding fufu. There was a system called kataso. 6 p.m., you have to cover your food. You don't pound any more fufu because you are disturbing the gods. Guess what was the good part of it? People ate early. Fufu is a very heavy meal. You need time to let it settle. And so they ate early. Religion was everything. Then, under colonialism, what happened? They introduced commerce, Christianity, and what they call civilization. Commerce. They came, they, they got the gold, they got rubber. And then they introduced cocoa. Everybody started planting cocoa. So all of those things changed the rural economy. How we live with each other. If you went to the farm, you got a big game, DS something, you cut it into pieces and share it among your immediate family members, your brothers, your cousins. When they get a game, they also do the same thing. There was no form of preservation. Today, everybody is what? Towards the nuclear family. Hey, you are not going to take it away from us. We can preserve it. So we are going to put it in the refrigerator. That which I didn't have, I didn't know. Today, I know it. I have one. You see how secular I have become? Yes. You have to preserve something. So we live in a secular world by what we are. Some of the point is because we have a nation state. 
In the past, we didn't have a nation state. This place will be hot. Fantis. You go a little further, my ancestors came from a Juma Kungumwa. And then you go a little further, they are sin. And on and on, uh, Takrade, you have the, the Takrade group. What do you call them? A hunter. Yes. Kumasi, Ashanti, Accra, Gan. The Gan states. So they lived together and they had their own religion. Then education came and brought us together. Whose religion should we embrace? Whose religion should we embrace? So we say Ghana is a secular state. I mean, how often, the things that I see on my computer when I turn it on, my phone, and I said, do these people have families? The things they say about themselves, the nudity they put out there, and about society, do they have families? When I was younger, the biggest deal was your family name. If a man retired from, say, University of Cape Coast after working for 30 years, at 60 you retire here. You young men, be ready. They will push you out at 60. And you go home. So you take your things from the bungalow of the university and go to, say, Jasso. When you get to Jasso, your family members are coming to inspect. What did you bring? The thing, they are not interested in how much you brought. They are interested in what you brought and whether it belongs to you or you stole it from the university. Because they don't want any bad name. Any bad name. 20 years ago, my wife and I were living in Kumasi, working with the church in Kumasi. My mom came to live with us, and her biggest meat is liver. So she asked me from time to time, and I'll go and buy liver from the Mayanka, the slaughterhouse. I brought the liver to my mother one day, and she said, son, sit down, let me talk to you. Since I have been here, anything I ask you to buy, you go and get it. Yam, liver, you took me to the uh, KGTR stores, and we get some clothing. Let me ask you, are you involved in this money uh, scheming thing? Because you basically get everything I need. Remember our family name. Remember our family name. Today, when we became secular, what happens to this society? The bigger, the better. If you don't have the things people have, you are in trouble. You are in trouble, yes. You are in trouble. It's bad trouble because people still don't understand the ethics that go with it. So secularism surrounds us every day. You only have one boyfriend and you are thinking you are going to marry this person. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. When people have what? Three or four. This one buys fried rice. This one buys Kelly Willie. As for this one, he buys credits for the phone. And that one is the one who supplies the phones. The iPhone. Yes. I mean, some of the surprises I got one day. I went to University of Ghana. Uh, I go there quite often. I go to the bookstore. I look at new publications. And my wife doesn't like that. I spent quite a bit last week buying some books. And so I went to Legon Hall, where I was. I was not in Commonwealth Hall, by the way. Legon Hall. University, university education. And no any Legon. Now, who called University of Ghana? What is it? It's Legon Hall. All those riffraffs in Commonwealth Hall and Main Sansaba Hall and all of that. Yes, I should have put on the Legon Hall shirt this morning. But today is the day of resurrection, so I'm a little bit calm. We don't make noise. We make grace. We don't make noise. We make grace. I went to the cafeteria to eat. You know, reminisce of the past. I saw a young man. He will be no more than 19 years old. I'll give him one. I would have said 18. But he's been in the university, so give him another year. He had a bowl of rice and a big bottle of beer. About 12.30 in the afternoon. <laughs> 
when I was growing up, you couldn't do that. You could not do that. In fact, women even drink hard liquor. Women didn't drink hard liquor. So um, Fanta and soft drinks, what do we call it in tea? A mansa. Women's drink. When you go to a funeral, when you go to any social gathering, they only took what? Soft drinks. Muscatella. Some of you don't know Muscatella. Pepsi, Muscatella, Fanta, Coca-Cola. Yes, that's for women. And my mom could not say uh, the moths. So he said the short neck, the one with the short neck. That's when women drink. Today, I can tell you, they are competing with men in what they drink. I have gone to funerals and we've been served and women yank out the total pack. The drink, the hard liquor, take it from the abrasia and pour it into the Fanta. They are as drunk as the men too. Secular world, secular world. People are free. They can do what they want to do. They can, they can choose. They are born biologically male or female, and in course of time, they decide to do something else. Everybody will know you in town that you are Kujubisia, you are a man who is pretending to be a woman. And everybody, that's what, looks down and shuns you. And it will mean you come from a bad family. It will mean that you come from a bad family, not just you. Today, who cares? Secular world. So the things that are going around us don't promote the Christian ideal we are talking about. And every day, as a member of parliament, the issues that come up and I contribute, you never find me on TV. How many of you have seen me on TV before? No? Well, I don't see any hand up. If you are bold, one? Once. Okay. I was just sitting there while I was speaking. Just sitting there. Okay. I speak a lot. But the things I talk about, they are not sensational for the media men and women to capture. Yes. Because they want the person who is upset and is yelling and uh, I don't want to mention it, but he's engaging with the majority and minority people and they, did God send me there to do that? No. But in a secular world, we have to win power. Well, for my role, we have to honor God in what we are doing. So secularism is everywhere around us. We go to these programs last two weeks. We were in Kufuria last week. A week today after church, I went to um, a place in the eastern region. And young ladies follow us to those places. They follow us to those places. And in my naiveness, I was talking to one of my colleagues one day in a very plush hotel where we're having a meeting. Somebody taps my, taps my back. I turned and there was this lady, nice looking lady, and she said, it's a proposal. And I said, what does that mean? <laughs> and my friend said, just let her go, tell her later on. Then he explains to me, they are here all the time. If you find some ladies sitting there eating and making faces, they are just here. A good number of them are students. And they have contact with the hotels and they call them when, quote unquote, big men are coming. They have money to spend. So they have their desktop at home. And now when they go out, they have what? A laptop. <laughs> Secular world. Secular world. So that level of secularism permeates everything. Permeates everything. And in your development, we have a problem. Yes. He goes, a world where no faith is preeminent over the other. Yes. Ghanaian religion, we have Christianity in all shapes, in all shapes. So some are as extreme as really like what is in the Bible. 
and some are way toxic, as if there is no Bible. Sikadari, yes, Sikadari, you can actually go to the church and they will what? They will double your money for you. And the pastor will heal everybody. And then when he gets money, he will build a university with a medical school and a nursing school. Why, I mean, what, what a contradiction. Why don't you continue to heal people? So no faith in is any better than others. All the things that were anchored in religion, we, 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 we lost it. We live in a world where economics, politics, law, and medicine are readily accepted and acknowledged in the public square than faith. And this is very serious, especially for your group. Because all the fields in which you are studying, they are telling you what? It's phenomenology. This is what is happening. And so don't, don't, don't do any faith. I went to St. Thomas Aquinas School, a Jesuit school in Accra for boys. When we got to Form 1, 1977, my science teacher came up and said, I know many of you are Catholics, or you are believers, but let me tell you this. Put your hand close to your ear. What do you feel? And some were bold. Form 1, some were bold to say you feel a pulse. And he said, OK. All that you'll be studying in this school is about this pulse, what you feel, what is evident. So put your beliefs aside. Form one at age of 14, 14. And this is supposed to be a Christian institution. I had a professor of psychology, I can mention his name, many people, generation of people know him, Dr. Frifa. He was a big name at the University of Ghana. He went to Columbia. He has a PhD in psychobiology. I'm telling you, half of his lectures was a lash and bash of Christianity, of how the Christians are stupid, and they are ignorant, and they believe in vain. In those days, Christianity was even more decent. There was the, what we call the Orthodox churches, Presbyterian, Methodist, really evangelical churches, not today's uh, riffraffs, anybody gets up and heals and offer miracles. And those days, that's what he was doing. People cried in class because he directly attacked their faith. He would pose questions and people would challenge him or they would answer. Their grace are at stake, as we were told yesterday, but also he attacked their faith. So in the process, it's a difficulty for many young emerging people. And for you in universities currently, you may be climate change and you are talking about how praying against climate change. Praying for water, praying for rain. What an ignorant person, that's what they will say. Let me say it continuous because somebody will say, I have said Christians are ignorant if they are praying. But that's the reality. There are people who can stand up and say, I don't go to any church, I don't have any belief. In the past, 40 years ago, nobody would say that in this country. Today, it is so common. We live in a, scientific, we live in a period where the scientific worldview holds sway over the religious worldview. There's a decline in personal religions, religious commitments, and a shift away from the eternal to personal choice. I have come across a few students when I was teaching at Gimpa. I was teaching ethics. And guess what? The very ethical principles that are in scripture, which in the management literature will talk about team building, talk about relationship, talk about collaboration. All these things are principles in scripture. But people were paying dollars to come for me to teach the same thing. And when I asked people about religion, we have lunch, and they say, I'm a free thinker. I'm a free thinker. So uh, my beliefs and practices are not anchored in any religion. It's just the social phenomenon. We live in a world which is going away. And part of it is influences from the West. Part of it is influences from the West. Teachers, uh, we are all going to school over there, but the choice of schools people go to, they bring it back. One of the courses, there was a question yesterday about the, if, uh, the sources of the secularism. 
And since we've been talking about dressing, dressing quite a bit, I told my wife, you go to the States and you go to the stores right now. A lot of the dresses that are hanging there, $60 and above, if you rip it, you won't get one yard. <laughs> yes, you won't get one yard. But the sad fact is, they sell it, people wear it for an occasion, oh, they wear it in the summer. In, by October, winter, they throw them away. It gets to goodwill. It gets into what? Used clothing is shipped to us. In a few, in, in 18 months, it will be on the streets of Accra. Those of us who go to Ben Dam Boutique, you go there and do your selection. And so, somehow, the culture is passed down to this place. Of course, you have seen it on TV, and now you have also seen it where? You have also seen it already available for you to buy. So the world view that we have, the cultural practices that is emerging, is one that is asking you to be away from Christ. There is a decline in personal religious commitment. Yes, it shifts. It shifts away from the eternal to personal choice. What is eternal? If you die, you die. You die like just uh, timing the dog. These human situations have implication on personal choices, choices and informed behavior. So if somebody is whatever, he chooses to be that, and that's the person. All right. Let me get into a few things about the developing young adults. First, a section of your life I call your sovereign foundation. Those of you in psychology, you would take Kohlberg, you take Fowler, uh, Vygotsky, other theorists. Jean Piaget is a big name. Uh, most of you who are doing education, you will come across that name. Jean Piaget, French medical doctor who became a psychologist and did so good on uh, schooling and uh, learning and all of that. Well, the interesting thing is from zero to 12, a child doesn't do much for himself or herself. It is who? It is parents. You didn't have a choice where you were born. Even the parents that brought you to this world, it wasn't a choice that you made. Why were you born at a certain time of the year? Why were you born at a certain location? Yes, if you look at the immigrants who are crossing the border illegally from Mexico and other countries to enter the United States, all they needed to do was just one inch away from the border, get born in the United States, and you don't have to go through that hassle. I call that face of our lives your sovereign foundation. God is doing things. Yes, God is doing things. As I stand here, I was born, my mom was AA and my father was AS. What becomes of me? AS. That eliminates me from certain things that I can do in life. Like what? Sports. When everybody's uh, white blood cell is round, mine is what? Is cylindrical. And so because of, like an egg, because of that, I don't store enough oxygen. So I can't run like everybody else can run. I can't do physical exercise like everybody else. They are normal, and we are what? Sickling. Of course, I'm not SS. So the sovereign foundation, that is the limitation I have. Somebody else may be so strong, he can jump and jump in the sky. Your parents will locate to a certain place. And because of your father being a policeman, every four years he moved. He lived in Tamale, you, you, you learn how to speak Dagbani. And he lived in Jasika, you learn how to speak Ever. And he lived in Sehi, you also became a Sehi. And you came to Cape Coast and became a Fanti. In 16 years, you can speak those four languages. You know the political implication? President Kufuadu speaks Ga, he was born in Swalaba. But he's an Achim, he speaks Tri. It asks to his credentials. He lives in Nima, he spoke Sawasa. He asks, I mean, he can cut across to people. Your sovereign foundation is not something that you did. But God was already at work in you. Jeremiah, you knew me. You knew me before I was born. And God knew all of us 
before we were born. So God is working in our life. During this period, time of great cognitive processing, we have my grandniece in our house is learning how to talk. And he, she babbles all day. I think she's saying daddy and mommy now. But a lot of cognitive processing. Now he knows us and doesn't like me. So I'm trying to embrace her and she's moving away from me and crying for the mother. She's processing information. Emotional development at this time. And social development. She'll play with other kids, but she won't play with me. God is at work in your life without much from your response at that age. Yes. Then from age 13 through 18, 13 through 18, I'm going to run these two faces very quickly and get to your face mostly. 13 through 18 is the period in your life of puberty. Pre-tertiary education, you are doing your junior high school, high school. Conversion, those who stay at home, listen to parents, go to church with them, they can become baptized during the camp meeting and other programs we have. You form active habits of life. Hmm. 13 through 18, so many things happen. So many things happen. We have a piece of property here. I bought that land 20 years ago, and I have a few blocks on it. That's about all I've been able to do. But any time I come to Cape Coast, we'll stop there around Agri. In the evening, one time when I came, in fact, three days ago when we came, we went to see it. But uh, when I came here a few months ago, in the evening, I was going from there, coming through Brafoyal. Agri students who have crossed from prep, they are supposed to be what, between 15 and 18, and they were all smoking weed in the evening. 13 to 18, adolescents, really people trying out things, testing out things, a certain level of independence because they are away from parents, boarding school. A lot of guys here, your position in life was probably fixed in boarding schools. Those who become homosexuals, girls who jump the school wall, spend the night in a hotel, in a brothel, come back in the morning. Those who don't do anything, don't study. I have a friend. With these days, discovering ourselves from WhatsApp, and he put on there, I spent five years at Aquinas for nothing. I didn't pass any of my uh, ordinary level examination. I failed all the whole level. I spent those five years wasted. All I did was just being able to pass to get to the next class. But in Form 5, I failed everything. He's now a lawyer in America, but that's what he did. That's what he did. So during this period, you are actually responding to the sovereign foundation you got. For others, it's going to be what? Inner life growth. The time that you respond and appropriate good values, because these are the critical years. Some culture, critical years are earlier. But in our culture, because children are to be seen, but not to be heard from, the critical years are much later, between 13 and 18. And a lot of important things happen. Some just said, yesterday we want to uh, pump gas. Uh, uh, Dr. Now I can't mention your name. Dr. Frank. We went to pump gas. I talked to the young lady there. Um, you know, every time I talk to people who are pumping gas who are younger. How long have you been here? She said, about eight months. I said, how long would you be here? She said, I don't know, but it won't be long. I said, I'm very happy, but where are you going? She said, maybe the military or something. I said, that would be good. But why don't you go to the military as an officer and not as an enlisted person? Because you are just going to salute. But if you get your bachelor's degree before you go in, you become an officer. She said, I am done with school. I will never go back to school again. Between 13 and 18, bad experience. Bad experience. And that can push people to do that. I am very disappointed, to say the least. Uh, about Friday, I saw the testimonial from the brother, I know him very well, Kwekuesian, 
about his experiences at Church of Christ Senior High School in Ateku. Do you know that it's on the front page of Ghana Web this morning? Anybody saw that? The testimonial. That says that he is an ungrateful and undisciplined and all the negative things that the headmaster said. And that person is supposed to be a preacher of the church. But it's on the front page of Ghana Web this morning. At least, maybe in a few hours, it will go down three or four items. But it was on the front page. 13 to 18, a lot of things happen. So you are going to go back there and do so many things. And we hope that you will change that culture. Puberty, education, conversion, ha active habits of life, music. Music. What is your favorite musician? Abodam. <laughs> yes, Abodam. Abodam. Food. Food. You know, no longer eat the food from the house. It has to be something bought from the street. Friends. Every time your reference point is, but my friends are doing that. My mother said, if you don't get away with those friends, I will slap you, you never forget. You can go and be with your friends. I have a friend, 16, and she started saying, as for me, I go to school this place, that place. The father said, I am so happy you are going to school. And I'm so happy you are going to school where you want to go. As for me, I'm paying for university, but I know where my money is going. <laughs> you can go all you want to go, wherever you want to go. But as for me, I know where my money for university education is going. The reason why he's going there, his friends are going there. His friends are going there. My wife and I were in a congregation in the US and the University of Memphis where we were going, they won some basketball game something. And people were excited. I mean, um, you probably follow those things in your country. Um, much madness. So when they came, they had to go to um, the military base and land the plane Delta over there because they want all the fans to come out. It was a very big thing. The next day in the commercial appeal, the newspaper in town, one of the eldest sons had his beer in his hand and he's shaking it. <laughs> 15, 13 to 18 choices. Choices. It really hurts our brother. He wants his son to be in the newspaper, but for what special effect? Holding a beer, that's terrible. So, yes, infatuation about others, 13 to 15. Today, young girls are moving in to other, with other people. It's my boyfriend. I am interested, uh, Brother Frank, about how young men and women develop the boldness to have a live-in partner with them. You are living with your parents, then what are the uh, exchanges that occur for you to now move in with a partner? I've had kids from my village. Their parents have bought all the things they need to get to go to secondary school. Maybe Kumasi, Brekum, somewhere. When they left, early dawn, 5 a.m. they left, three, four days time, people said, she's hiding in a room in town. She's living with somebody in town, and they have given her the school fees to go to school and pay. Does it sound something familiar? Something you have seen before, 13 to 18. So these backgrounds, whether you are obedient, whether you become skillful, whether you enjoy sports, drugs, drugs. Yes, I alluded to the weed smoking. But now we have everything. We have everything. The chief of my town, the son went to Catholic University. He's a drug addict and has been jailed in Ghana. I mean, to be jailed in Ghana for really doing drugs, you are really into it. You are really, because, I mean, the police have too much to deal with, and you are a weed smoker. If you are a seller, maybe they will hassle you. But if you are a smoker, I mean, 
probably the liberty people have is like Jamaica, where we smoking is, is free. But he has been jailed. They steal anything they, they can uh, reach in order to go uh, use it for drugs. Yes. Betting. Oh, big deal. I am surprised. Somebody won 70000 in my village through betting. And it's like it's sweeping everybody in my campaigns, going to villages. I have about 180 communities I have to go to for every campaign. So you go there three times between when you win the primaries to when the main elections come. Every village that I went, there was a kiosk where they are selling lottery. One city, 50, they even do 50 pesos because they are all illegal. Every town they are there, no matter how poor it is, they are there. And now we have the betting. Now you can do it on your phone. I took a class at the University of Memphis on the sociology of gambling. Sociology of gambling. I'm telling you, gambling is very addictive. Kids sell their things at school to gamble. And the old people, they run away from school because they get into debt. And you know, in America, when you enter university, immediately they are going to flash money in your face. Credit card, your first credit card. As soon as you pay your fees, they know it. Discovery will send you a card. American Express will send you a card. Visa will send you a card. MasterCard will send you a card. It may be 200, 500, or some up to about 2,000. You have $8,000 in your pocket right there to spend. And bookmakers have their representatives on the campuses. In fact, in some of the public universities, some professors are even involved in it. It's a huge club. And now it's here in every shape and form. Every shape and form. Soccer, the English lake. When I was a little boy, they call it football pools. And it's old men with glasses, small glasses, trying to look through it. The national lottery. People know what numbers will drop and they stick. And the funny part is those who win, what happens? If they saved all the money until the day they won, do you think they would do it? No. If they win, then the desire and the strength to do it is even much more. We have to get it stationary because they can be a commerce. So again, it is a big deal for your generation. 13 to 18 year olds pick up those habits. And in fact, I know people who have stolen money and run away from their parents' stores because they were involved in gambling. They were involved in gambling. Bullying. Some get bigger than others and they bully 13 through 18. And then peer pressure. They are going with their friends. Now, from 19 to 29, it's even more serious. It's even more serious. Personal independence, you've gone to university, you are here, anybody can visit you. You choose what you wear. In school, uh, pre-tertiary, you wear uniform. Now, I'm aware. They wear anything, I'm aware. Conversion, how does it happen? You are in university, some left home, to go to university and never went to church again. But I listen, is this something you are seeing? Their parents even send you a message, I'm sure. I have sent you one and she never came. You followed up and followed up and never came. And I'm sure some of you know others. I'm thankful that maybe when you got to 200 or 300, you gained your senses <laughs> and came back. Because some will go home and they are what? They are so obedient, they will go with their youth group, they will go with their parents, they come to school, they are different. Yesterday, Brother Fred was alluding to one. This young man became a judge. We were in school together. He came back as a teaching assistant, doing his MPhil in economics. And he became the choir master of the Vanda City. If you know that in Commonwealth or at the University of Ghana, 
They sing profanity. And our brother became the choir master. <laughs> our brother became the choir master. So really young adult life, personal independence, conversion, higher education, and some go to the extreme. You know I'm educated. Uh, they front their education. Who among you here has this degree? Even our congregation, no degree. A sister told us, I can't find anybody in the church to marry in Ghana because they are all uneducated. I said, wow. You should go and see Dr. Poku, the optometrist. He, he is married because the humility that he wants, you can't even offer that. And many more. Yes, higher education, so now they are above everybody's standard. Identity formation. What is your identity at that point? Your identity is what? To your profession? Your identity is to your friends, your peers, and people that you, you hang around with, or what? Travels. There are some who have made up their mind. They can't make anything out of Ghana unless they travel. Some waste years. All they are doing. And when the legal process didn't occur for them to get a Canadian, American, or UK visa, what happens? They get on the desert and thousands die every day. They collect bodies. You uh, get on YouTube and look at migrants dying in Las Palmas and other places trying to cross the Mediterranean into Europe. You will be surprised. Maybe that's not a route you want to take. Manager training, you get a job and you are getting training and uh, they check your background and everything is decent. Let me tell you, the things you are putting on Facebook and some of the other uh, platforms and applications, they don't go away. And employers are looking at those things in order to make decisions about you. So when you show up for the interview, they have printed those things and they may look, them, uh, look at them and ask you questions. So your nudity, your comments about uh, uh, politics and how everybody is stupid and offhand comments that you make, employers are looking at those things also. Enlistment into the military, the young lady told me that's what she's going to do. Ordination, to become a minister of the gospel, or ordained for a certain purpose, or certification, professional license as a teacher, most of it will occur between 19 and 29. And then you start a professional life. Some start a professional life and they have never worked before, and all of a sudden, they struggle. They struggle. They have not used no good sense of time, so they are always late for some, everything. Meetings, team meeting, he is not there. Then some of the things that may happen in your professional life. We are socialized in school to be what? Independent. You write exams, you want the best student, the, the one who becomes the top of the class. You go to industry, is it independence? It's collaboration, it's teamwork. It's our team. We are trying to develop a software. We are trying to develop a program or something like that. And then what happens to you? You can't work in team. You are frustrated all the time. But it's interdependence. These people do theirs and you do yours and all of you put it together. So between 19 and 29, these things are occurring. Young adults are occurring in a secular situation. Then your mother says, oh, Ajua, we are so glad you have finished your degree. And in 18 months, you have also finished your MBA. And this job is so good. We just love you. Now, what is next? What is next? The what is next is what? Marriage. Marriage. When Brother Fred was talking about churches going to check on people, 30 years ago, when you were a young man, the elders would call you to some road, said, we see you are, you are doing well in life. So when are you getting married? We have some recommendations for you. <laughs> it's not arranged marriage, but it's recommendation. Today, they will look at you and say, are you OK? <laughs> Do we need to take you to a doctor to check you out? You mean you have somebody for me? Me? Hey, 
I have some nephews, a big suggestions for them. So oh, this one, she will be big. I said, this boys. This one, she will be, I said, what about Christ? Do you see Christ in the person and that everything else can work out, beginning with Christ? So, well, but the looks are also important. <laughs> but the looks are also important. And I'm sure the ladies will say, and the cash is very important. Yes. We are looking at getting some iPhone and iBox and i i private vehicle and i house and you are talking of what that's the secularity around us yes how many people are getting married in the church church people are too dull you know they don't go out and have fun yes you want somebody who can i had a colleague he was trying to get me to go to a nightclub and I said, I'm 55 at the time. I can remember. I said, I'm 55. I've never been to a club before. Why do you think I will go? Oh, it's an experience. Then I said, okay, if I experience it, then what? Then it becomes part of me to continue to go to the club or what? I've never been. I missed it. I don't know what is there. I don't miss it. 19 to 29 can be a great time of being a parent. And when you become a parent, your sense of responsibility increases. So all of these phenomena can actually occur as you develop. Some underlying principles concerning your adult Christian faith at this point. Christian faith is actually developed from a faith tradition. It doesn't occur in a vacuum. That is why we are very, very interested in Christian marrying Christians. Because in a Christian community, then you nurture that culture and it becomes part of everybody. My philosophy, for example, is if I'm taking care of nephews, which I have, we have had many of them live with us, we want them to live in our house, I pay their fees, they go to school, they come back, they eat with us, they pray with us, they go to church with us. They see what we do. Yes. Not just tell them about when, look, Church of Christ is right. Oh, if you are going to go to heaven, go. You have to go to Church of Christ. Yes, that's good. But also, they have to see that in me, in my home. And so, a faith tradition anchored in a culture where that is exercised and can be seen, that is very principal. Again, Christian faith is anchored in a community of believers, the church, a community of believers. Some are very interested in going to heaven. They are interested in things about Jesus, but they are not interested in the church. It's a huge problem because they have some takeaways from the church, like what? We don't dance and jump and exercise and go to the gym. <laughs> but after worship in fact I have I have thought about this people really like all this dancing and jump they said I should stay closer here I'm a teacher I'm used to walking around and what it is is let's have church we come together we pray we sing with joy we uh, commune with the Lord we have inspiration from his word shared with us we have close God's time with us at this assembly then students sponsored program in the foyer gospel jamboree gospel jamboree and maybe they can dance and jump because you don't have to do it with any meaning I have gone to places graduations and other things and I'm telling you the music is loud and people are very active with the shaking of the handkerchief. Amazing. And I'm sure you've seen those things. Did you see the barrier of uh, the apostle of the uh, Pentecost church? A very good man. But I'm telling you, the dancing that took place in the front of parliament where the service was heard, it was big. It was big. So the faith community, this is where you get your nurturing. 
This is where you have people of like mind that work with you. I'll say a few things more about the church, but your Christianity is exercised in a faith community, the church. Christian faith comes with a commitment with lifestyle or behaviors. A lifestyle. It is not about what. It is not about a set of propositions about what you believe and now go out and do what you want to do. No. They are integrated. So you are not, your faith is not in a silo and your behavior in another silo. They are what? They are together. And so it means that your mere profession by saying I'm a Christian doesn't exempt you from a certain lifestyle. But that indeed, if you are a Christian, it has to be seen in how you live your life. Yes, how you live your life. Christian faith has answers for life after death. And this is very important to me because when people say, look, one day born, one day die. What? Enjoy yourself. And what are they enjoying themselves with? Rice and chicken? <laughs> what are they, I mean, what are they doing to enjoy themselves? Drink. Drink. So that drink, what did it do for you? The last end of our Christian faith is that we have eternal life. And for me, that's very important. There are so many things that happen in my life. They have dates. I know this, this will end on this date, that will end on that date. But eternal life, I have no control over it. So I submit to a sovereign God who is going to make everything new, do something new in my life. And he wipe away every tear. There will be no more crying because all the former things are passed away. So eternity should be a challenging factor for us to really wanting to do that. So with all these ideas, as they sit out, we want to anchor it in the book of Ephesians. And I was just giving a section. So I'm just giving a little bit background to the book of Ephesians. But this is not, you can do that as a subset of your presentation. So Paul wrote a letter to encourage the personal faith of the Christians in Ephesus. Because they have a lot of adultery, a lot of immorality, it was a port city, and bad things were going on. It gives teaching, prayers, and great praises to God. It is about God's Son, Jesus Christ. He came to our world in order to put right all the things that had gone wrong. Paul makes clear that Christ is the head of the church in the book. He will work out his purposes in and by the church. And that is why we say that you cannot ascribe to Jesus and not want to be part of the Christ community, the church. You cannot. So God is working out his purposes when he talks about the manifold wisdom of God in the church. And all of that makes us want to be in that community. The church is evident in the life of the believers whose public and private lifestyle tell of their encounter with Jesus. Their encounter with Jesus. Because after they have been with Jesus, they are no more the same again. And that encounter is what? It's not a one time. Our hearts should be baptized every day. Our minds should be baptized every day. Our actions should be baptized every day. We are talking about what? A Christ-centered approach in which everything, the decisions we take about, why am I going to do a master's? Why am I marrying this person? Why are we moving to this place? All of those things should be because of the church. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? That's the Jesus. And if you have been with him, are you walking each moment by the crucified? That's where the criticism comes. That is where people are going to say bad things about you, gossip about you, just because you are doing the right thing. But are you walking each moment by the crucified as we think? So now let's look at the book of Ephesians uh, based on two sessions that I see there. One, I call it Ephesians book one. Please don't quote me anywhere. There's no Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2. But for easy remembrance, I say God, what God has done in Christ. That's the first section of the book, chapters 1 through 3. 
and I call it the indicative because in this section of Ephesians is actually describing through prayers, through advice, through everything else what God has done in Christ for the believer. God's glorious grace in Christ, it merely teaches us about God's plan for the world. The plan is for all time. It is about the gathering together of all things to Jesus Christ as head. God created men and women. He created them to be his friends. But now they are apart from him. They are his enemies. God's plan is to fix the unity that is broken. Ephesians 1 through 3. All the scattered passages. So just let's speak a little bit of that. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Who is my reader? Ephesians 1, 3 to 6. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. With every spiritual blessing, yes. Why are you going to a certain man for other spiritual blessings? Obinim, God's way, on the East Legon Road, said he has access to God. A certain man, I won't mention his name, I could be sued. But he said he traveled to heaven for one hour, 45 minutes. Have you heard that? Yes. One hour, 45 minutes. Ay, 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 ay. Hey! Aden! One hour, 40. Oh, okay. One hour, 45 minutes he was in heaven and he saw a, a manufacturer of a certain car. Did you, did you see that? Did you hear that? Social, social media, uh, friendly people. Yes. What? Okay. He has blessed us with all blessings and has spiritual blessings. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. He chose us. He. Holy and blameless and Whoa. He chose us to be blameless and holy. Do you know we can be? He confessed it upon us. He, he puts it on us. I have an illustration. It is like you are standing at the bus station where there's no tents, which we have many of them. You just stand there. The rain is coming. You have no shelter. Then somebody throws a thing. Says, anybody who wants to stay out of the rain, come under it. It's a choice. He has it. He has given it. All you need to do is to what? Accept it. Come under it. That's what it is. He chose us and he gave us to be a holy people. It is not because of your holiness. Sometimes we study with people and we tell them, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that. And you know what they tell us? I like girls. So I, I will not come to your church. I will still be where I am. You see, I have, I have a friend. He's in a very powerful position. I can't even say it. And I have known him for close to 20 years. And I have influenced him a lot. He was almost at the point of becoming a Christian. But he said, I'm young. I need to sow my wild oats for a little bit. And then I, I will join you. Osafu, I will join you. You, I know you are there. You are always going to be there. When I'm ready, I will come. Does that seem something to you, young adults? When I'm ready, yes. But right now, let me do a few things out there. Yes, continue. He loved, he us for adoption to sonship. He, that, he did that through love, yes. Uh -huh. In accordance with his pleasure and will. It is his will. It is his will, not because we compel him, yes. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. He has given this to us in the one he loves, Jesus Christ. So he has bestowed upon us things that we didn't, uh, we didn't deserve. And things that ordinarily we can't even do. Holiness, perfection, but he throws us the shelter. And we come under that and he changes everything. Okay, let's get to chapter 2. Yes, we are picking a little bit of what he has done. Yes. Two, two, one. one through nine. Uh -huh. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions. Look at the states they were. Dead in your sins and transgressions. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. I like the, I like the terms that you used to live. Hey! 
And of them. Why? Why? Who am I? Who am I? But you used to live. And how huh? continue? That you follow the ways of the world. You follow the ways of the West. We are Sydney, meaning I'm rough, rough. Obi Krasi and Kenko Fade said so. Best and Kamehu. And all kinds of suggestions that people have made to you. And some steps that you took that were really bad. Some you, can, you are even ashamed of confessing. That's fine. But the point is, Jesus came to your life. And what change? Great change. Come on, come on. Yes. Change. I was born. Great change. Since I was born. So great change since I was born. That's it. Great change since I was born. Great change since Jesus came into my life. He said, all of these things that happened were in the past. But now there's a change. Go on. And of the ruler of the kingdom. The ruler of the kingdom, the evil one. Yes. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. The spirit which is in the lives of those who are in disobedience. All of us also lived among them at one time. Paul said, look. We didn't get it at the beginning. We all lived in it in the past. But, uh -huh. gratifying the cravings of our flesh. Gratifying the cravings of our flesh, and gambling, exactly. addiction, sex, drugs, what? Cravings. Yes, I call no bunny. I call no bunny. I call no con con fancy for you. I call no con con. Con con. Terrible. Why am con? Fantiful being you have. I don't know how you're going to It is horrible, terrible. Yes. Go on. And following its desires and thoughts. Look at that, desires and thoughts. In some fun, aqua, aqua. In some fun, you are sitting there planning bad things. How we are going to, some are pranks, some are really lifestyles that you adopt. Yahoo, Yahoo, boys. Yes, you want to be like you want to be like everybody. You want to be like Johnny. Yes, go on. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Deserving of destruction, God's wrath to really wipe us out. You are no good. You are useless. Yes. But because of His great love. Oh Lord, have mercy. Because, because. Adenti na mere na wasi yeho. Yanko. Tina Mary now Yes. Why would I not thank you, my Lord, if I look at what you have done? But how do we thank God? Is it by showing up, dress up on uh, Resurrection Sunday? That can be a thought, but a lifestyle devoted to Jesus Christ, a life committed to Jesus Christ, a life of transformation, a life of community and submission to Jesus Christ. That's what we are talking about it. Continue. But because of his great love for us. Because of his great love for us. God, who is rich in mercy. Oh, Lord. Made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. Made us alive, yes. It is by grace you have been saved. It is by grace. So, here... A vivid description of what God has done in Christ on our behalf. All right. Then he gets to the second half of the book. Ephesians 4 following. I'm going to anchor it in the passage I was given. 
here how God will use Christians in the plan of a new life for all. Paul teaches that the church is like the body of Christ. Christians must be like Christ's hands to do Christ's work. Christians must be like his mouth to speak for him. They must be like his feet to take his gospel to all the people in the world. God wants to deal with all the things that divide people. So we talk about the unity in Christ, unity in families. But the bottom down, God will do this in and by the church. You can't rule out the church. So the second part, I call it what? The imperative. Now I get into that. All the descriptions about what Christ has done is what? Is the indicative. It's talking about what he has done in Christ, his forgiveness, his grace, his mercy, all of that. Now we come to the imperative. Because of what he has done, we must what? We must logically follow. Are you not the ones who do critical thinking? What is the critical thinking issue here? He has done all this for us. What is the logical response? Behaviors. He says, I don't want anything back from you. I don't want anything back from, back from you. If it's traditional society, he will have to give us what? Some drink. And you people, academic people, you don't know how to tap palm wine. To bring God palm wine. Cain and Abel, you don't have a farm to bring any produce to God. Or to bring your best animal to God. He said, your life. Your life. Yes, your life. So, essentially, now he anchors it on the life. Yes. So from verses 4 through, uh, chapters 4 through 6, he's talking about the new life in Christ. Because of what he has done, you have to live differently. In the former life, it was like that. But now in the new life, the imperative, the imperative, because of what he has done, indicative, now we have to follow logically with a new life. So now let us anchor our discussion on chapter 4, 17 through 32. Verse 17, chapter 4. So I tell you this. So I tell you this. All right. Now, a new chapter starts with, so I tell you this. Nobody starts. I wake up in the morning and say, wife, good morning. So I tell you this. Said, Augustine, did you take your medicine? <laughs> because we don't begin any discussion with what? So I tell you this. Brother Frank, so I tell you this. No. Something has preceded. What preceded it? That's what we are talking about. What God has done in Christ for us. Because of what he has done. Yes. So I tell you this. Uh -huh. And insist on it in the Lord. And insist on it in the Lord. That you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Okay. Yes. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Okay. Continue. Finish it. For the futility it. of their thinking. For the futility of their thinking. They are on their uh, yeah, let's, let's, start, let's stop there. I took a very liberal translation, easy for everybody to understand. I tell you very strongly not to continue to live as the Gentiles do. I say this in the name of the Lord because the ideas have no value. Ooh. I'm telling you, if somebody said in Parliament, I hear what he's saying, but what he's saying has no value. Hmm. TV3, you see the journalists running, everybody opening their lenses to capture the response that will come from the other side. Mr. Speaker, I want you to know that it's unparliamentary for him to say that. And the people of Ghana are watching. This is a house of record. And they will just go on and on and on. He said the ideas have no value. The gentle ideas. What is gentle? The other nations, the worldly ideas, the ideas that don't do anything, that don't make anything, say it has no value. Whoa! That's it. In reality, the worldly people's ideas that they seek to influence us with, what is the value of it? Nothing. Let's go to the beach in the night. Let's go, let, let's do this. Let's, we, we find that there is no systematic process to end your life in any way. Then what does it do for me? At 55, let's go to a club. 
You need to drink something. Then by I also prove a loom. I also prove a loom. Yes. And have you seen them in the blue kiosk? When they are coming out and they are hitting their chest, the, the alcohol is so strong and they can't, and they are hitting their chest. Ay, 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 ay. I'll tell you very strongly not to continue to live as the Gentiles do. I say this in the name of the Lord because the ideas have no value. Verse 18. They are darkening in their understanding. They are darkening in their understanding. And separated from the life of God uh -huh. because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Due to the hardening of their hearts. Simple translate. Their minds are confused. Hmm. Worldly people, their minds are confused. Is it girls? Is it booze? Is it drugs? Is it drugs? Is it, I mean, anything goes. Their minds are confused. They are like blind men who can see nothing. They do not know about the life that God gives. They refuse to listen to him. The life that he gives. The new life that he gives. The new life that he has given us, they don't know. But that is the changing force. The great change since I was born, that is it. Verse 19. How many lost all sensitivity? They have lost all sensitivity, so there's no stopping point. Uh -huh. They have given themselves over to sensuality. Okay, to so worldly things, yes. So as to indulge in every kind of impurity. Every kind of impurity, anything goes. Whatever you think about, you do it, yes. And they are full of greed. Full of greed. Here I have, they do many things that are wrong, but they are not ashamed. They are just going, they are not ashamed, yes. And they want a critical mass, so they want every one of us to join them. That's the issue. A LGBT, you are one, stay at your home. No, gay pride. Gay pride. Very soon, polygamous people are also going to take on the streets. We want more wives, yes. We want more wives. So they do all kinds of wicked things, and they become even worse. And they want more and more to continue to do this thing, these terrible things. That is the gentle way of life, the non-Christian approach, yes. So what is the basis of the gentle lifestyle? And I say, no basis at all. You are just doing it. You are just going. He's just beating his wife, not feeding his family. He's just staying with anybody he finds on the street. Nothing. Yes. So what do you mean? Where are you going? He's just going. Any road leads to anywhere. So he's on the road. What does it, how does it manifest itself? In the act of ignorant living. That's what I say. In the act of ignorant living. It's not a life anchored on Jesus. It's not anchored on any principle. They are antisocial. They, they destroy the social fabric of society. The worldly people. Yes. Yes. And now I put out there, your theology determines your sociology. And in my classes, I would have said, discuss. <laughs> your, your, from how far we have come, do you understand what we are doing? Your theology determines your sociology. Your beliefs about God determines your association. And I will use your uh, sociology broadly as your lifestyle, your social fabric, your political, your religious, your economic, your social, your cultural, your educational are all supposed to be connected with Jesus. But because you have a bad theology, it affects everything else. And the bad theology is the gentle way of life. Worldly people. It's just worldly things. All the things that he does, it's just worldly. Yes. He says, they do terrible things. And they continue wanting everybody to be with them. All right. Then knowing Jesus and living by his ways changes things. Verse 20. That, however, is not the way of life you learn. When the you way about Christ. Okay, that is not the way of life in Christ. 21. And we're taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. Very good. 22. You were taught with regards to your former way of life to put off your old self, 
which is being corrupted by its deceitful desire. Mm -hmm. This is the whole point this weekend. You must stop doing the bad things that your old nature liked. These things were destroying you. These, were, these are the things. When Satan divides life into two, and you have the Christian one, and you have the secular one, and you operate in such a way that you are a friend of both of them, then what happens? You just don't get anywhere. They destroy you. These things were destroying you, and they are destroying the people who have not seen Christ. Because they go to church, but at the end of it, church has become what? Just a mere ceremonial something. Today is Easter. Many people who don't go to church will go to church. I have many friends around the world. They go to church Christmas and they go to church Easter. Easter Sunday, resurrection. Jesus, whatever I have done over the year, you forgive me. Today I have come. But next year I will come back. Hmm. The intervals between your being with Jesus is so long. It's so long. Please. Bridges based on the first day of week principle. Yes. 23. To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Yes. You must learn to think in a completely new way. In a completely new way. Yesterday is gone. Another day has come. God, what? Do something new in my life. Do something new in my life. Let's sing that song. My time is running out. But let the song speak to us. Yes. Yes. Gone. Another day. something new in our lives because of the transforming power of Jesus because he's changing everything and making things new um, let's speak a little reading from Ephesians 3 14 through 19 3 14 through 19 Ephesians 3 14 for this reason I knew before the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name uh -huh. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power. He will strengthen you with power, yes. Through his spirit. In through your his spirit. Being. In your inner being. Hmm. Yesterday we were talking about inner being and outer being. The outer, everybody sees it. Brother Dankwa from KNUST gave us a vivid picture. The outer is nice. You have gold watch, you have bangles, gold, and you have chain and he looks nice. What about the inner being? What about the inner being? I remember like 40 years ago at the Bible College, uh, the dean then, uh, Brother Young, somebody didn't sweep his room before he came to the assembly. And he was furious. So he came and said, mentioned his name and said, what do you have on? He said, I have on a suit. What do you have on again? He said, why should? He said, you have worn a suit over a dirty shirt. Wash a coat, a thing so. Your room is dirty, and you are looking so nice out here. 
That's what he's talking about. Yes, he looks out, outward. Everything is nice. But the inner being, the eyes may be open and strengthened so that we will see the inner being. The change is inside out. Transformation from inside out and not outside. Inside out. And it is exhibiting what? Righteous living. Go on. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. Uh huh. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that the passes knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen. That is what he's praying for, the Ephesian brothers. And it's extended to us. It's extended to us that we will come to a full comprehension, death and breath, deep, a deeper understanding. But he's talking about the change that should come. Yes. Being taught of Christ, casting out old self, thinking in new ways, stop bad things, and using a refreshed mind. He now gets specific from verse 25 following. Specific behaviors of the redeemed. He said, after I have shown you this broad changes in your life, now specific things. Verse 25. Therefore, putting away lying. Putting away lying, yes. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Yes. You must not tell lies anymore. We must all speak the truth to each other because we are all parts of Christ's body. How can lies? A lot of things begin with lying. And the big one is, why didn't you come to service? There will be 200 reasons, from illness to electricity to water. I mean, in our culture, we have everything. It rained, and there was no bus. And then what? And then a uh, professor threatened, if we don't come to his lecture on Sunday, which some do, but he says lying. Whichever form that you can cut a story to make you look good when the obvious truth is there. So lying. Then he says anger. If you are angry, you must not let this anger make you sin. You must stop being angry before sunset. Otherwise, the devil could make you do something that is wrong. Anger. Then he says stealing. Stealing. If you are a thief, you must stop stealing. You should work and do things useful with your hands. Then you will earn something that you can share with other people. They may need your help. Then he says about speech, verse 29. Do not use bad words. That may hurt somebody. Your words should help other people as they need it. These words should help them to become better people. So the bottom line is we are talking about transformation from inside out. And that is what, what a man thinks that's who he is. And so stop thinking about, if this doesn't go well, I will lie about it. And this doesn't belong to me, but how do I rationalize so that I take it? Corruption is eating us up in this country. Imagine we have dedicated people who will just collect their fair salary. And everybody will say, let's put a stop one day to corruption in our country, a day of no corruption. Then the next day we say, let's do a second day, a third day, and eventually let it become a lifestyle. Everybody wants something. You go to a government office, they are ingratiating themselves, and you know if you don't give them something, next time when you go there, you know how they will treat you. Or towards the end of the story, you get to a certain point, you find out that if you don't give them something, whatever you are looking for will not happen. So you have to assure them, I will settle you when we finish. Yes, it is so common. And I'm telling you, the corruption, it occurs in political places so bad, but it occurs in everyday life. Everyday life. From faculty members selling pamphlets, that's nothing but Wikipedia. Yes, 
the distance learning program courses. They photocopy them and they sell it to students. Write down the names of all those who buy it. They already have 30 marks. Those who don't buy it, they are in bad shape. They are in bad shape. Who are you to go and ask for remarking? You are finished. Yes. He's going to call the head of the department. Fail him. Fail him. I have been approached like that before. I had to do remarking when I was teaching at Gimpa. And the person called me and said, just give him 48, 49, so that he's below 50. The continuous assessment will settle him. He, can't, he doesn't come to classes. Well, is there a policy about coming to class? So then let's apply that policy. Let, don't put pressure on me. But I know we have pressures all over. Do not lie. Do not be angry. Do not steal. And let your speech be seasoned with salt. The final parts, verses 30 through 32. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Mm -hmm. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. 32. And be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to be very snappy here. He says, verse 30, you must not make God's Holy Spirit sad. Remember that he is God's promise. He knows that you, he knows that you belong to God. And one day he will set you completely free. So do not grieve the Holy Spirit by your bad conduct. You are a Christian. Why are you doing these things? Yes. Why are you bringing your family name into disrepute? The family community. Then he says in verse 31, you must not hold on to any bitter hurts, rage, or anger. You must not fight each other or say bad things about each other. You must not think or act because of spite. Hmm. I wish every Christian knew this. I wish every Christian knew. Don't we know this? I wish every Christian applied it about bitterness. A lot of young people don't go to church or they are not committed because their parents said bad things about the other leaders. Whether they were talking on the phone or in the car as they went home, mother and father are talking and they are just lambasting everybody. How are the kids going to grow up loving those leaders? Even when you, have, you, you find there are problems, how do you handle it? Your bitterness can be passed down to other people. Verse 32, kindness and forgiveness. You should be friends. And you should be kind to each other. You must forgive each other just as God forgave you. God forgave you because of Christ. So where are we on that? Where are we on that? I'll put up a song as my concluding thought. He paid the debt he did not owe. I owned, I owned the debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt I could never pay. What a moving Christ. What a moving effort. He paid the debt at Calvary. He cleansed my soul. He set me free. I'm glad that Jesus did all my sins erase. And now sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Jesus Christ paid the debt that I could never pay. Finally, one day he's coming for me to live with him eternally. Won't it be glory to see him on that day? And then we'll sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. So these are thoughts that I bring about the evolving, emerging young adults. The challenge we have in a secular society, by Christ Jesus, pay the debt so that we can be new, we can be transformed. We can have a former life and we can move on, marching with him, being with us, forgiving us, cleansing us, shaping us, transforming us from inside to be new. How would you take it? So I have some questions. Quickly, yes, Brother Frank, quickly. I said, one, reframe your personal salvation history in terms of the indicative and imperative paradigm in Ephesians. 
reframe it as it applies to you. How do you see my suggestion that Ephesians basically gives us an opportunity to see being a Christian as having an indicative and because of the indicative we have an imperative. How do you cast it within your own faith journey? Is it too difficult? Is it complex? Break it down. Understanding the question is part of passing the exam. Once you understand the question, you are ready down to answer it. Yes, anybody? You are well dressed, but still this is a Bible class, so you are allowed to speak. So don't hold it. Yes. Yes. Reframe your own faith journey. Journey in terms of the indicative and the imperative, if you understood what I'm saying. If nobody asks any question, it means this is above everybody. But in our class there alone, 26 people, the kind of things people are studying, it blew me away. The scholarship that you bring to the class from cell biology, molecular biology, history, Educate, I mean, so the paradigm of the indicative and the imperative, how does it express itself in your faith journey? Anybody? This session. Sometimes people don't ask questions because they are processing it. And that's good too. You are processing what we've been talking about. But then when you go out, be humble and don't think you came from University of Ghana, so you are older than the other universities. So if you really came from University of Ghana and you are in this session, redeem your university. <laughs> redeem your university in the, by reframing your own faith journey in the paradigm of indicative and imperative. What am I saying after all? What am I saying? What is Paul saying in Ephesians there? Although he didn't put it in those terms, but based on the fact that this and this is happening. Anybody? Middle row here, University of Ghana, followed by KNUST, followed by Winneba, 1972. Oh, no, uh, followed by University of Cape Coast, 1972. Winneba, 1994. Okay, yes. Go ahead. Okay, so thanks so much for the teaching. Um, looking at the Sovereign Foundation, uh -huh. I grew up at uh, Pashma. Okay. And we had a lot of uh, Zongo boys around. Yes, rock boys. Uh, so we used to play for from morning to evening. Yes. And even sometimes with street lights. Um, I got uh, registered. Street lights. Yes. Play is still under it. Yeah. Yes. Do you play gutter to gutter? No. Do you all know gutter to gutter soccer? You play it on the street. You put a stone on each side, two stones on each side at the goal post. So the goal is to get the ball inside the gutter. <laughs> We've done things. So uh, I used to play for a team called uh, Manchester. Wow. Uh, yes. <laughs> And I hated church so much. When your parents are going? Yeah, so I only went to church because I was afraid of my dad. I didn't I remember I had to forsake church to register at Kanishi to go from there. Then we had to move to uh, Kaswa. Yes. So before we moved, my coach asked my dad if I could stay with him. But my dad hated me so much. But he said that is this a grown name? So when I went to um, Kaswa, um, my dad started wearing goats and sheep. So I had to cater for them every evening. I go to search for them. Then at the age of um, 14, 15, um, we had to move from our manager to the Road to Kaswa. And there was a problem with the leadership. They were afraid. The one who taught 
lots of monetary issues had to go. And my father, who is not too educated, had to take out the teaching. So I had to love him. Meanwhile, when he comes home in the evening, I'll be watching movies and stuff. But I would call him because I'm afraid, I had to go and help him with a dictionary session of things, trying to translate it, but he had to try and teach. Even though he was very uh, knowledgeable, he still had his challenges. So he calls me, and I'll be very sad. My siblings will make fun of me, and I have to go. But as I continue to learn with him, I start discovering things in the Bible for myself. And it goes to a time when he doesn't call me, I ask him, won't we learn today? So I see that moving from my former place to Kaswa was God working in my life. Mm -hmm. And even what happened in the church, that my father had to be in a position to teach, was also God working in my life. Yes. As SS, even in form one, I was teaching. So when I look at all these things, I, I was a very good person. I used to beat my younger brother a lot. <laughs> and I remember in form one, I slapped a lady six times. That then she, she started having this food coming out of the ears and I was, I was beating and my parents were called. But thanks be to God, for five years, I've not raised the hand of my wife. <laughs> and so I see God grab her. There are some weaknesses I pray he still helped me to overcome. But when I look at what he has done for me, mm -hmm. someone like me, giving uh, me the opportunity to have hope, peace of mind, and bringing me this far, I think he has done a lot. So for the imperative, I owe him nothing but appreciation in the way I do. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Wonderful. What a great change he has made in his life. In all of us, if we could stand up boldly, boldly, uh, I remember there was a man in my village. He was not a very kind person. He has orange trees. And he won't let kids plug, uh, get any of the oranges. So I had a friend. We were like 12 before I moved to Accra. In the evening, after dinner, he gets back in the village. We go there and plug some of the orange. We are full. We don't need to eat orange in the night. But we go there. And, I mean, it's hanging. You can see it. This is what the Bible calls desire. <laughs> and Isaac and I, we plug some of the oranges. And we eat some and throw the rest away. For the what? For the what? God, thank you. Yes. Transformational journey. And uh, in the retreat, I worked through a long process of this to really show what God has done and therefore the journey that we want. I'll just get into. How does it help you to make moral decisions? Decisions of what? Of right, decisions of wrong. How does the church help you? Winnie Balegon. Accra Legon, uh, he redeemed you. So Winnie Balegon. Yes. Yes, sir. Can we get a mic to him? Quickly. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I came from a remote area where we don't have much leadership in the church. Okay. And during my second cycle education, Okay. During my second cycle, during my second cycle education, I'm somebody who doesn't take my dress and appearance to be in. Yes. But because of the deficit of leadership during service, I'm being asked to support in the way. So because of that, anytime I'm going in, at least I need to look good, not in a fancy dress, but at least. Something decent. Sure. And during that and all through that era, I still did not because of the church and my how I'm supposed to appear before them. I may not be able to look how I'm looking to the media, I may be looking a little rascal, 
we pray that it's our children, our pastor, the church, in that time to have influence my appearance, and since then, whenever I appear for any committee, for any decision, or any meeting, then because of my appearance, anything that I'm going to say, they somehow accept it and give me that opportunity. Very good. Very good. Yes. Yes. Somebody said you are addressed the way you dress. You are addressed the way you dress. And he says he would just have had anything on, but because he knew he is a Christian and he's going to exercise leadership standing in front of people, he raised his standard decently. Yes. Decently. So that's wonderful. Yes. Any thoughts on that side? Brother Fan, would you give me five minutes to let them ask questions too? We are not doing too good on time. My boss said, you cannot ask questions. So contact me. I'm a nice guy. I will answer your questions. But he said, I can't. Our time is gone. So what I'm saying is, I have mentioned a lot of things. Scripture, I have tried to sketch the developments in your life as a young adult and the issues, secular issues that come up, the spiritual things that you can use to respond. Now we have to go and do better. All the Bible classes that we attend should be a way of helping us to be equipped to live in Christ and therefore to work for the kingdom. Everyday basis. We are not talking about, oh, if you grow up, then you do some fine things. The way you dress for lectures, how you say hi to people, how you don't cheat in the exam, how you collaboratively work with other students. Yes. Yes. I talked to my old professor, 93 years old, Dr. Lin, McLean. And he has a, a small thing, Nations University. So we're having a conversation on the phone. I haven't seen him in years. And he said, Augustine, let me tell you, the students of today, they are very good. They write good papers because they use AI. And what happens is, actually, when they turn in the paper, everything looks good. But the book that they are referencing has not been published. <laughs> Yes, I don't know how they do it, but that's where we are. So we are talking of exercising discipline, really committing yourself to a transformed life, even now, before you get to where you want to go. Get to wherever you want to go in life. But the point is, if Christ is with you, is the hope of glory. And he will be with you in everything you do. So let Christ be in front of us. Let him walk behind us in our shadow. As we turn left or right, let Christ be with us. When Jesus is in the family, happy, happy home. Find Christians, marry Christians, work Christian, and live Christian. There's so much more to do. And we hope that in the future, but our Frank and other universities will work with us, the team, to have different versions of TSC. And some issues that we have raised here, we can actually address them. Again, I appreciate the kindness of the uh, TSC 24 committee for asking me to come. And I'm glad you have tolerated me this, this while. So I can be a politician. But a Christian. I can be a minister of the gospel, but a Christian. And if you do them well, Christ is glorified. You two go and glorify Christ. Amen. Amen.